Thank you so much. What an incredible privilege it is to be back home at Southern Seminary and always uh, Dr. Muller is so kind of you, the introduction, and, and uh, it's is such a blessing uh, to see you and Mary. And it's interesting. I'm surprised you remember the story about the, the intensive care. Um, uh, Dr. Muller had a illness. I still remember the Cure Journal calling me, asking me how serious your illness was, if it was life or death. And I said, no, I think he's going to survive. I never, never heard them so disappointed, you know, at the time. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> But, but I do remember going to the hospital to see him, and Mary said, you could use some cheering up. I said, okay. So I go in, and intensive care, they don't let, but typically one or two people in. So I went in by myself, and, and he, he was uh, medicated a good bit, and so that was fun. And I, I remember, <laughs> he's like, you know, they say, they say I'm, I'm pretty sick. I said, no, you're in intensive care. You, you, you are very sick. And, and uh he mentioned the fact that, you know, there's a chance I could die with this. And I said, well, I understand that there's always that chance when you're in intensive care, you know, that's a chance. And I said, if, if, if that does happen, is there a chance I could have your library? <laughs> so, uh, but he appropriately laughed. But um, one of my favorite, my favorite parts uh, and again, you guys know Dr. Moeller is the president of Southern Seminary, but what you, so much about him that you don't see um, how he witnesses on planes and how he, he, he so loved our people. Our people love the Moeller's. And uh, in, most in most churches, you have a pastor's class where the pastor teaches the Sunday school class. It's a, a larger class. At Highview, that wasn't the case when the president of Southern Seminary, it's called the Dr. Muller class. And so Dr. Muller taught us Sunday school class. It would end up being a very huge class. And we would typically put all the miscellaneous people in there. And when people would show up, just kind of show up on the spur, uh, we would shift them to his class, obviously, for, for several obvious reasons. One particular Sunday, I still remember, a trucker had come off the Gene Snyder and found our church and, and wandered into the church and wanted to go to a Bible study and then to worship. And so they ushered him into Dr. Mulder's class. He sat in the very back and, and listened intently. And I still remember the, the funniest thing is what one of our guys said that he went up to Dr. Mulder and said at the, after the class, he goes, Hey, Al, I don't know what you do for a living, but you're one heck of a Bible teacher. And so... Uh, <laughs> so appreciate um, their ministry and just your, your friendship. It's always so good to be here and see Dr. York and, and uh, Paul Aiken. My word, he was a seventh grader uh, in our church uh, when he moved to Louisville. That was pre-high school graduation and pre-CrossFit. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> I'm so thankful. <laughs> so thankful to see all, all, so many friends. I'd like to share just a little bit about... Um, the North American Mission Board. We're going to be in Acts 13 if it takes you a while to find it. Uh, but I want to tell you a little bit about the North American Mission Board. Everything we do, everything we do at the North American Mission Board is about evangelism. It's all about the gospel. Now, we have 3,700 chaplains all over the world that the North American Mission Board endorses that you should be very proud of. I posted pictures on social media just this past week of soldiers that were being baptized in Poland. And uh, it's incredible the, the work our, our, our chaplains do all over the world. We have thousands of missionaries, but years ago, uh, the North American Mission Board did a lot of things, but was not very focused on any one thing. They weren't bad things, it was just a lot of things. And, and they were spending about 13% of their budget on, on church planning. And there are a lot of different ways to do evangelism. I really believe that the scripture teaches that planting churches is one of the most strategic ways to do that. And so we wanted to bring a focus and help people understand when you hear the North American Mission Board, you know exactly what their primary focus is. It should be uh, the gospel, but the best way, the primary way that we do that is through planting of churches. And so uh, we went through and, and we had, at the time, we had people doing things that were not bad things. They just were not the best things and the best steward. I mean, we had, I mean, we had actually clowns on staff. Uh, and when I got there, I had Tater Tot and Bobo. And uh, we let them go <laughs> um, the same day. But... Um, it was very scattered. 
And what I want to do is bring a sense of focus that we had one way to assess planters. We at the time, every state had its own way of doing things. And which, it's, it's since they liked it, because they had their own way of doing it, but everybody's standard was at different levels, and some of them were not very high. I went to one particular state in the West and said, what's your standard for church planters? And they said, a pulse. And I went, do what? And they said, if we could just convince somebody to come here, we'll fund them. I was like, that is not a very high standard and not one that we need as Southern Baptists. And so we came up with Send Network, which is a brotherhood of church planners and churches that want to invest in church planning. And that's, the, uh, that's what we did in 2010, brought that sense of focus. And now over 55% of our budget uh, goes to church planning. And, and for the sole purpose of making sure that we are able to uh, discover and develop and deploy Planters, And that's why I want to encourage you today to consider, just consider what your next step might be. And, and even if you're confident, I just want you to always be in prayer and hold it very loosely because in my life I know, man, uh, I, my life has called audibles. I have six kids. I'm very thankful for those six kids. We adopted our youngest three. The youngest three came from China, Ethiopia, and Philippines. And I often tell people, I've got six kids from four different countries. You know, when we watch the Olympics, we win. Um, we have, I love them dearly, but life has thrown us curveballs, and we've had to call audibles along the way and adjust, and that's what you see actually in Acts 13. But the reason we focus on church planning is we, if we're going to push back losses, we have to be focused on um, strategic areas. In Southern Baptist life, 85% of Southern Baptists live in the South. 85%. 85% live in the SEC and the ACC. It's the rest of the conferences we're having difficulty with. And that's why we have to plant churches in the Northeast, the Midwest, West, and Canada. And it's working. Let me show you just a few charts, just real quick. And in, in D.C., here are some dots of what the churches look like in D.C. back in 2010. All right? Those are the church plants in 2010. This is what D.C. looks like in 2020 with church plants. That's because of the faithful giving of Southern Baptists through the cooperative program and the Andy Armstrong Easter offering. Then you take a city like, say, L.A. Here's what L.A. looked like in 2010, and this is what L.A. looked like in 2020. Now, the whole purpose of that is that we plant churches that plant churches that plant churches. And you look, here's a national map, if you will, of just kind of a satellite view, if you will. This is what the church's plants look like in 2010. And then this is what it looked like in 2020. At the current rate, and we believe we can speed it up, at the current rate, if we continue to plant at the current rate, by 2030, um, over 20% over, um, of the Southern Baptist Convention will be made up of churches planted since 2010. Now that's why you are so critical. And in Southern Baptist life, my word, I, I, I just wanna encourage you, um, Part of my job in North America is go all over North America. I was just in Florida on Sunday, recently in Houston, Tennessee, Washington, go to California, just all over. And what I'm so thankful for is 99 point, perhaps 9% of Southern Baptists are incredible people. They really are. And they love you, and that's why they give faithfully to support you being here. And they pray for you. And I've heard them pray specifically for this school and that man. And uh, they would be something you're very proud of. But we live in a very toxic time where you get on social media and you look at a few people go crazy and you think, oh my word, Southern Baptists have lost their marble. It's a dumpster fire, it's this or that. And I just wanna encourage you to, to know that that is not the case. There are some crazy people out there. There really are, it's unfortunate. But the jerk factor in the SBC is very small. The guy who, uh, who started the Ritz-Carlton said that he wrote a book on excellence wins and said that even the Ritz-Carlton cannot please 2% of the people. He's come to find out that in, in life, 2% of the people are unpleasable. He calls it the jerk factor. So I started doing calculations real quick. It's 47,000 churches. If you have a jerk factor of 2% in the SBC, that's 940 churches. That would be 2%, 940. So I started a list on my iPad I'm up to 57, 57, you know, and it's just, so I just want to encourage you to keep things in perspective. 
that it's not a dumpster fire. In the midst of all of this, man, God's people give millions, hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Some interesting facts, though, about the uh, churches. Did you know approximately 9,000 churches? 9,000 of the 47,000 churches baptized 90% of the baptisms in the SBC. 90% of the baptisms in the SBC come from 9,000 churches. 9,273 churches gave 90% of the cooperative program. That's 19%. Dr. Chit was here on Tuesday. IMB, uh, more than half their budget and half of our budget comes from Annie Armstrong Easter offering, but, but in Paul's, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. 6,700 churches of the 47,000 gave 90% of that offering. My point is this, you know, Twitter can be ugly at times. It really can. But our biggest problem is not that the SBC is on Twitter. Our biggest problem is the majority of the churches and our wonderful denomination are not on mission. Whether it be giving or whether it be going. Paul needs more missionaries to go on the field, and we need more planners to plant churches. When I was a pastor and I, I preached on giving, I'd always start with one thing I did find throughout all my pastoral years is when I preached on giving, my people didn't mind preaching on giving. Actually, the ones who gave appreciated me preaching on giving. The only people who did not appreciate tithing sermons were people who didn't give. So I'd always tell them, you listen after I'm done. If you hear anyone complain about this sermon, you mark it up. They don't give, all right? So I just want to encourage you today as we look at Acts chapter 13, the importance of, of going and being sent, taking that next missional step, okay? All over North America, we're trying, Paul and I together, are trying to mobilize, if you will, churches to be on mission. And what does that mean? thought there would not be a better example of that perhaps in Acts 13 where the church of Antioch sent out uh, Saul and Barnabas, eventually named Paul, obviously. And so let's read the first uh, few verses of Acts chapter 13. Here it goes. Now there, was, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, and it lists several of them there. And it said they set apart, they were, after they fasted, the Holy Spirit set apart for Barnabas and Saul for the work to which they called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and they sent them off. I want to focus on those last few words. They sent them off. The beautiful thing about the, the church at Antioch is they were outwardly focused. The church at Jerusalem was inwardly focused. The church of Antioch was outwardly focused and they were sending their very best. It said they laid their hands on them and prayed uh, for them and, and to send them off. Now, what did that actually represent or what did it mean? It meant they were saying to them, look, as you go, we go. We are sending you to go on our behalf and we have your backs. We call that ascending church. We don't send any church planner uh, anywhere unless they have a sending church, a church that says, yes, we verify that this person's good standing with our church and we want to send them on our behalf to plant a church in a particular area. Church at Antioch did that. They laid their hands on them and they prayed them, as you go, we are a part of you. Churches have a choice to be ascending church to look outward or always just to look inward. I really believe in the end, success will be determined for churches, not by their seating capacity, but by their sending capacity. It's all about being focused on what God is going to use you to do to reach those outside of your walls. And then in verse four and five, notice what it says. Not only being sent, but being obedient. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them, John Mark. What I want you to see there is simply they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. 
We're sent, first of all, you are sent. Every one of us are sent. It may be across the street, it may be next to the person you work at at a factory or a store or your neighbor, it may be another city, it may be another country, but we are all to be on mission wherever we are. Here, not only being sent, we have to be obedient. We must be obedient. And that's exactly what was happening here. They were sent out by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. And you read that throughout the book of Acts. They were led by the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Being led by the Holy Spirit. To me, that means they were com- when they were completely obedient, they, were, they, they understood they were completely dependent. There's two things about being led by the Holy Spirit that I pray you never forget. You are completely dependent upon God for absolutely everything that you do. And you must always be completely flexible. Because we, when we intently look for exactly what God would have us do and try to discern what God's will would for us would be, often I was convinced it was certain, one certain thing and I took a step or two and then, and then things shifted and, and God shifted me back to the direction he wanted me to go. I just want to encourage you, you've come to an incredible place to learn theology and practice of ministry, but never ever forget that you're completely dependent upon him. Completely, if you're led by the Holy Spirit, completely dependent upon him. God often calls people to do things greater than their ability to accomplish. Greater than their ability to accomplish. When you do things greater than your ability to accomplish, obviously he gets the glory and you do not. What I found, people like a comfort zone. They like to do things they know how to do. They know what their skills are and they learn their skills. They practice their skills and they stay within. Often they'll say, I'm gonna stay in my lane. What that means is that comfort zone of just doing what I'm comfortable with. But I really believe God often calls us to do things outside of our comfort zone. To be completely dependent upon him and then completely flexible. You know, there are moments as you look, read through not only Acts 13, but you read through the entire book of Acts, 14, 15, 16, 17, all the way to to 18, especially they were headed one place and then they were shifted to another. They were gonna stay a long time in one particular city and then they were cut short and they went to another. What I'm saying is there were constantly audibles being called. I mean, it's amazing how you start out one way and you end somewhere else. I look back at uh, how we planned for our family and how we planned for ministry and I had all these five-year plans, a 10-year plan, and I mean, none of that really panned out. Thank goodness. I look at the audience and say, you know, my word, you got Dr. York there. He was a custodian in a church in Memphis. But God says, look, I'm a, I, got, I got something else I'm going, I'm going to uh, use you to do. And then eventually be a pastor and be dean of theology. I mean, my word, there on the second, second pew, you got the, an editor of a state paper. And did it very skillfully. We're still amazed how you got Mary to marry you, but still for God to <laughs> take a state editor paper and send him to a seminary to do a radical transformation at such a young age. I saw Aaron Harvey, who's currently pastor of Highview, doing a much better job than I did. 23 years ago, I got on a flight here in Louisville, sat down by a seminary student named Aaron Harvey, and I said, uh, where are you headed? What's your name? He told me his name, and he was headed to Philadelphia. He's going to plant a church. I said, my word, you know, we're looking to, to plant a church in the Northeast and, and ultimately have you help plant that church in the Northeast. And I'm just saying, things happen and God brings people in your lives that you never dreamed. So don't underestimate how great a skill you have. You're always dependent upon him. And don't overthink your strategies because God often calls audibles but one thing I found, and, and uh, Dr. Mueller alluded to it, um, it seemed like I always went to ministries that had challenges. I went to a, a church in Illinois. I followed a pastor who had a moral collapse. I come here, I follow a pastor who had a, um, a moral disaster. 
regardless of where you are, there are challenges that are going to come. And uh, you just need to prepare yourself for that now. If you're hoping you prepare yourself so that man, you feel like God, you're right where God wants you to be, it's going to go smooth, that's not the case. I can tell you personally, you know, as we adopted kids, and we're so thankful we did that, but there's more to that than they put in the brochure. In ministry, I'm so thankful that God allowed me to pastor. My very first church, they voted me in seven to zero. It's my only unanimous call. <laughs> People laugh, but we were on TV, so don't underestimate the power of one little church. We only had seven. We were on TV. We were on the TV show Cops. <laughs> they arrested people in front of our church, and we made national TV. And so <laughs> you're going to have challenges. And look at this verse in verse 6 when it talks about being challenged. There's external challenges and there are internal challenges. When they had gone through the whole island as, as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a, gov- a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is his, meaning of his name, opposed him, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. I won't go, I don't have time to go into all the detail here, but what I want you to see is you're going to be challenged from the outside. Here you have basically a governor that wants to know more from Paul and Barnabas. And his right-hand man, who was very influential, said, no, 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 not good for you. Let's look back up. That's not, that's not the best move here. Let's don't do that. Paul approaches him and says, look, you son of the devil, quit perverting and distorting the path here. It's not that hard. It's very simple. And you're distorting the path, not making it straight. You're making it crooked. So they dealt with the outside, and you often, when you leave here, you're going to anticipate some outside interference. But you know what I've found? Is sometimes it's the internal problems that, that are the biggest challenge, even inside the church. And that's what happened. If you read on, in this particular case, John Mark went with them. That was uh, Barnabas' nephew, most would say. And he was like your first summer missionary. And, 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 and John Mark went with, with them, and... and in the process, they went to Cyprus, and if you look at where they went, starting in Acts 13, they started at the nicest places. It's like going to, you know, Bahamas for Jesus. And so they went to Cyprus and the nice places, but it began to get difficult, and so John Mark goes to Barnabas and says, this is hard. This is really hard. This is not what I thought. You know, I, I want to go home. And so they send him home, and what you, you know, don't, you see under the, the, the surface here is it really chapped Paul that the kid wanted to go home, but they sent him home. And it was very difficult to get him home, but, but they sent him home. We see later on, though, the very first of the second missionary journey, Paul says to Barnabas, let's go back and check on all the churches. What do you say? He says, hey, sounds great to me. I'll call John Mark. He goes, John Mark? No, 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 no. Barnabas says, oh, yeah. He says, no, no, no. The kid wimped out the first time. I'm not wasting my time on him a second time. Barnabas says, look, I don't know if you've read the New Testament, but it's Paul and Barnabas. I get a vote. (laughs) So we don't know the detail of the conversation. All we do know is the Scripture says it was no small disagreement. So much so that Paul took Silas and went that way. Barnabas took John Mark and he went that way. So you have a great missional team divided. Now you have two missional teams. This is a positive spin on it, but you can only imagine the discussion is of Paul and Silas going this way, all that Paul just filled Silas's ear full. You can only imagine. Can you believe Barnabas? I mean, he just, he, he ministers by his heart, not his head. You know, I know he's the encourager, but good grief. <laughs> then you can imagine Barnabas and John Mark. That had to be awkward. I mean, John Mark knew, like, the reason we're going this way is because of me. He says, Uncle Barnabas, man, this is so, I feel so bad about this. I, I feel, look, what Paul said back there is true. You know that. I did exactly what he said. I am so sorry. I, I don't, I'm so sorry. I don't know details. You don't know details. I can only imagine, though, Barnabas being the encourager, put his arm around John Mark and said, John Mark, look, Paul was right. He did some things you shouldn't have done. That, he did kind of wimp out. But by my word, we serve a God of a second chance third chance and he's promised never to leave us and forsake us and you know what John Mark I'm sure he probably put his arm around him and said you know what Mark 
I really believe in you. I believe God has some special things for you in the future. Who knows? You may even write a book one day. (laughs) If you're sent, you need to be obedient, led by the Holy Spirit. You're going to be challenged from the outside and from the inside. Some of the most difficult people I had to deal with in the churches that I pastored uh, uh, were on the pulpit committee a year after I was there. You know, they were on the pulpit committee, and then a year later, I didn't fulfill all their expectations. But the thing I'm so thankful about Paul in the fourth part is he was faithful and focused to the finish. Let me show you this last. uh, When it talks about, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. One thing I want you to remember about the Apostle Paul. Through thick and thin, through challenge and through prosperity, great things happened and challenging things happened. You know what? The center of his message was forgiveness in Jesus. It's all about forgiveness in Jesus. He was faithful and focused to the finish. He stayed focused on the gospel. It's all about the gospel and repentance. I just want to encourage you. That's what, why you're here. That's why we do what we do. But as you do it, it can be very discouraging but God is incredibly faithful. That's why I love if you'll fast forward with me just to real quickly in Acts 14, 15, 16, 17. If you read all of that, the challenges he went through, I mean, it was stone thrown into jail. I mean, it's, it's time and time again, difficulty after difficulty. Some things that went great, some went very challenging. But I love this particular passage because I've gone through moments of incredible challenge. Uh, and my life been sued many times and and uh, it's just not been pretty in a lot, a lot of days. And remember, this, these two verses helped me really more than just about anything. Is when, when Paul was at a dark point, although some good things were happening, but he was at a dark point. It says, the Lord came to him in a vision in Acts 18, 9 and 10. It says, and the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will harm, no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. What I love about that is the very first part he says, Do not be afraid. And actually, the tense of that usage is, Stop being afraid. You're afraid, stop it. Paul, stop being afraid. Concerned about sharing with the Greeks or the Jews or this or that and people complaining. Stop being afraid. Don't be afraid. I've got this. So he says to him, stop being afraid. The second thing he says to him is, go on speaking and do not be silent. You keep on speaking and don't be, don't be silent. You keep talking about repentance. You do not shut up. You do not quit, Paul. Do not be afraid. Do not quit. Do not be afraid. You keep on speaking. You do not quit. Man, I love that. Do not be afraid. Do not quit. But it would basically be a spiritual pep rally if that was it. Because he follows it and tells us why we do not have to be afraid. When you leave here and you come uh, into opposition or challenges, you do not have to be afraid and you should not quit. But he tells us why. The next part is, for I am with you. Hey, can you say that with me? For I am with you you for I am with you for I am with you you're never going to take a step where I'm not going to be there I'm the same yesterday today and forever I will be faithful every step of the way there's things I went through I wish I my word I did not enjoy but I'm so thankful on this side of it looking back how faithful God was he has been with me that changes everything about your life when you can get up every morning go to bed every night knowing that he is with us and we really not only just know it but really believe it got married back in 1985 December 28 1985 a wonderful lady Lynette we had our first semi-major marital discussion challenge in March of 1986 It's still celebrated today in something called March Madness. (laughs) I was watching a Kentucky game, which I'm a big Kentucky fan, and basketball game, and she wanted to talk, and I just simply said, could we just wait until after the game? It was the wrong answer. (laughs) 
And uh, she said, you know, you have a problem. And I said, well, what do you mean, babe? <laughs> she says, you're too competitive. I said, too competitive, what do you mean? She said, well, you yell at the TV. I said, no, I'm simply encouraging the referees to do it better next time. <laughs> you yell at the coaches. I'm, again, just reminding them of who's on the bench. And, and, and again, I know they're, they're kids, but we do pay their school. I think they need to be encouraged. Okay, I, and she's right. I would lose myself a bit and get engulfed in it and get up. And sometimes I'd even get up really close to the TV and, <laughs> and yell a little bit louder. Now, Mary, this is a sports illustration. Would you please interpret for Dr. Moe? <laughs> and so I realized real quick she was serious. This is a problem. So watch the game. I would get too consumed. And I, I remember I'd call friends of mine. I was like, I hate that I hate, I hate that I take this so serious, but I can't not take it serious. I mean, I just can't do it. So I started doing something there. I, t- I do this now, and it works wonderful. I changed years and years ago. I don't watch games live. I don't. I tape them. So I tape them. You say, you don't find out the score, and you watch them later. That's not how I do it. I tape them. I find out what the score is. And if we win, I watch it. <laughs> and if we, del- if we lose, I delete it. Now, I know we got beat by some peacocks a few weeks ago. I've not seen it. <laughs> I won't see it. Not on your life. I only watch games we win. Uh, one of the favorite games I love watching is the game we beat Michigan a few years ago. I've watched it over 30 times. <laughs> we would watch it together uh, as, as a family. I remember we were, my favorite, it's my favorite game. We were down by over 10 points at halftime. The announcers were negative, negative, negative. Kentucky's down by 10. They'll never come back from this mountain. They were just negative. I mean, all this negativity. Did it bother me? Not on your life. (laughs) I know how it ends. I was up at the refrigerator making me another peanut butter and jelly. Life was good. Second half, we're down by six points with about eight minutes to go. I'm not nervous. We're down by one point. I'm sorry. We're down by two points with one minute to go. Down two, one minute to go, and they have the ball. Am I scared? No. I'm petting my dog. (laughs) Because I know what happens. 40 seconds left, we steal the ball. We come down, we pass it around. We're going to get a shot off. I bet we do. They throw it to a guy named Aaron Harrison with three, two, one. He shoots it. Does it go in? It does. Every time. <laughs> That's a silly illustration, but you know, it sure changes things when you know the ending. It really does. <laughs> I have no idea what stands before you. I have, I have no idea. But I happen to know one who does. And he will be faithful to the end. It's tough out there. It really is. But I love how he ends that. He says, for I have many in this city who are my people. And one particular version says, I have many in this city who you do not know. And what he's saying to him is, look, Paul, you're in in Corinth, Quill and Pasil, but look, I got many in this city. I'm going to use you to reach, and you have no idea what I'm going to do through you. God often calls us to do things much greater than our ability to accomplish. And he will be faithful. As you're ascent, obedient, challenged, be faithful and focused to the finish. Father, thank you for how you love us, you care for us, You know everything about us and you use us anyway. Father, we thank you for your grace and may we never get over it. Lord, may we just be astounded every day at your goodness that you'd use us. I pray that you help every person in here, as gifted as each one may be, understand that they are always completely dependent, 
completely dependent upon you. Father, I thank you for what you are doing, but we look expectantly into all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.